Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome to part one of my lecture on chapter 13, Water Resources. Uh, about 66 slides to go through, so I will do this in two parts, uh, about 33 or 34 slides uh, in the first part, and then again the same uh, coming for part two. So once again, here we go, chapter 13, Water Resources. Uh, we're going to start off with a case study like we normally do uh, with these lectures, talking about the Colorado River story. So the Colorado River flows through 2,300 kilometers uh, of the United States through seven of the states uh, out in the western part of the country. Uh, the entire system of the Colorado River includes 14 dams and reservoirs. Uh, water is supplied mostly from snowmelt off of the Rocky Mountains. The Colorado River supplies water and electricity for over 40 million people. Cities of Las Vegas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, and San Diego get their water from the Colorado River system. Uh, they all, it also irrigates a lot of crops that help feed America. Unfortunately, there have been issues with it. Very little water is reaching the Gulf of California because, uh, because of all the dams uh, on the river and because of all the irrigation or the taking of the water to not only irrigate but to um, have drinking water for people in all those cities I just showed you. Uh, very little water is actually uh, ending up in the Gulf of California. The system has experienced severe drought since 1999, and Lake Mead, which is part of the Colorado River uh, system, uh, fell to a record low water level in 2015. So one of the issues here, obviously, we're going to talk about in water resources is a lack of fresh water uh, out there for people to drink. Obviously, uh, if you don't have water, you die rather quickly. Um, so again, fresh water, very, very important. And here is the Colorado River Basin, again, pretty much beginning near Boulder and traveling all the way down to the Gulf of California. Again, you'll notice the dams that are along it, the reservoirs as well. Um, and again, the problem is now by the time the water reaches the Gulf of Mexico, California here, there's not much water left because it's either been used to uh, either pumped out to drink or pumped out to irrigate or again uh, is trapped behind these dams. So will we have enough usable water? Fresh water is one of the earth's most important forms of natural capital but unfortunately it's used inefficiently and is polluted. Uh, water doesn't cost that much so because it has a low cost it encourages waste um, and also fresh water is not accessible to all people, believe it or not. Again, here in Ardsley, you know, we turn on a faucet, there's fresh water. Uh, but in many parts of the world, that is not the case. And that's obviously a big, big problem. So fresh water is an irreplaceable resource that we are managing poorly. Access to fresh water is a global health issue. Over 4,000 people die each day each day from lack of access to safe drinking water. Uh, it's an economic issue. Water is vital for producing food and energy. We spoke about it um, when we spoke about uh, mass food production, right, in a previous chapter, how there's so much water that is needed to produce food on a mass scale. It's a national and global security issue, right? Because if one country doesn't have water and the neighboring country has fresh water, you know what happens usually, right? That country tries to invade or go into the other country to try to get that, that, those resources. And that can obviously lead to wars and security issues and obviously environmental issues with excessive withdrawal uh, of these, of our aquifers, of our reservoirs, uh, which we will talk talk more about. So most of Earth's fresh water is really not available for us to use. Only 0.024% of our water supply is available for fresh water for us to actually drink and use for crops. This means groundwater, lakes, rivers, streams. Think about that. 0.024% very, very small. Why? A lot of the water on this planet obviously is salt water, which is not usable for drinking or for irrigation. In addition, a lot of our fresh water is actually locked up in snow caps at the poles, right? North Pole and South Pole, not usable. I mean, it is, but from a monetary standpoint, it's not usable water uh, that we can use efficiently to drink and to irrigate crops. So again, 0.024% uh, of our water supply is the available fresh water we have to drink and irrigate crops. So again, not a lot. All right, uh, what's the hydrologic cycle, otherwise known as the water cycle? You guys know that from elementary school, the movement of water into the seas, land, and air. 
but it is distributed unevenly, right? The Sahara Desert doesn't get as much rain as we get here in Ardsley, vice versa. Down in the tropics, they get more rain than we get here in Ardsley. So again, it's distributed unevenly, that water. Um, and of course, we are altering the hydrologic cycle humans by withdrawing and polluting the water and causing climate change, which is, which is causing a change uh, to that uh, distribution of the water. What are we seeing here? We're seeing some... Um, Females in Africa um, walking through a desert. This is the tradition. They have pots on their head that they actually carry water in. They obviously had gone to an oasis somewhere where they were able to get water. And now they're walking back to their village, balancing the water uh, on their heads. But in many parts of the world, guys, this is how they get fresh water. So again, every time you turn on your faucet at your house or here at school, we you know put our water bottles right next to the water fountain and get that water. You should think of this picture and think about what others have to do to get fresh water to their families. Again, carrying on their pots, uh, carrying uh, uh, water on pots on their heads through the desert is how these folks uh, need to get water uh, to their families. All right, groundwater and surface water are critical resources. All right, so a couple of uh, terms to understand. The zone of saturation is spaces in the soil below a certain depth that are totally filled with water. The water table is the top of that zone of saturation. So below the water table, the ground is totally saturated or totally filled with water. Above the water table, uh, the ground is not totally saturated or totally filled with water. What are aquifers? They are basically underground reservoirs. They are recharged naturally by precipitation or by nearby lakes, rivers, and streams. So a reservoir under the ground is called an aquifer. What is surface water? Again, that's water on the surface here, uh, surface runoff and a watershed basin, which is again where water kind of runs off into streams, rivers, and lakes, and then goes into the ocean or again uh, feeds those aquifers, which are those underwater reservoirs. So uh, here is your hydrologic cycle or your water cycle. Again, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, right? We also have runoff, all right? And we also have infiltration, which again, goes into the aquifers. Difference between a confined and an unconfined aquifer. Confined aquifer would have a layer of sand or silt, right? Small particles above it that kind of confine the aquifer. Uh, unconfined aquifer would not have that above it. And again, we can go down and we can pump out the water from these aquifers for drinking and for irrigation. But what we're going to learn in a couple of slides here is that we're pumping too many, uh, too much water out of our aquifers, uh, and that's leading to a lot of of problems. All right. We are using increasing amounts of the world's reliable runoff. Two thirds of surface runoff, however, is lost to seasonal floods. Reliable runoff is the remaining one third of the freshwater source. So once again, the runoff, we're not even able to use all of it, right? We're really only using a third of the runoff because two thirds of it is lost to seasonal floods, which we can't actually access. Uh, worldwide averages, irrigation for crops and livestock, 70% of our fresh water is used to irrigate crops and to feed uh, or for live, livestock to drink. Industrial use, 20%. Cities and residences, that's us in our homes, about 10%. So most of the fresh water, again, what did we talk about when we talked about mass agriculture and mass meat production and mass fish production, right? What did we say? One of the big issues was the amount of water that is being used. And there you go, guys, 70% of our fresh water that is reliable on this planet is used for irrigation of crops and livestock. Only 10% is used for actual us drinking uh, in our homes. And again, industry uses about 20%. So obviously we need to cut down this 70% uh, in order to save water. So what is virtual water? Virtual water is water used to produce food and other products. It may not go directly into making it, but when you talk about all the other uh, distributions, the materials, the travel, et cetera, et cetera, to get these products, all right, producing and delivering these products, it's showing you how many bathtubs of water needed. So for, to produce a cup of coffee, believe it or not, for those coffee beans to be produced, you almost need a full bathtub of water. A loaf of bread, to produce a loaf of bread and deliver it, four bathtubs full of water. Hamburger, 12 bathtubs full of water is used to make one hamburger. And you know this, one full bathtub is 40 gallons. So you can do the math. 
to make a pair of jeans, 72 bathtubs of water, to create a house, over 16,000 bathtubs full of water needed. Again, it's not directly needed, right? You're not using water to build your house, but to get the materials you need to build a house, to produce them, to deliver them, all that stuff, right? Virtually over 16,000 bathtubs full of water. So obviously you can see why fresh water is such an issue or not having enough fresh water is such an issue, not only here in the United States, but around the world. All right, here's a case study, freshwater resources in the United States. Uh, there is more than enough renewable fresh water. And again, fresh water is a renewable resource. It can renew itself, okay, over uh, in, 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 in a generation or so. But again, it is unevenly distributed and in many parts is polluted. So what we're looking on the, uh, looking on the right is the primary use of of water um, in the US, again, electric power plant cooling, 41% of the water is used for that, 37% irrigation, livestock four, industry five, there's your public water, 13%. Okay, this is in the US. On the right, this is showing us a typical US household. So on the left was the US as a whole. Now we're just going to go basically this 13% and kind of break that up a little bit. So in your house, 27% of the water used is used to flush toilets. That's why they say if you cannot flush your toilet every time you use the bathroom, again, doing number two, you may not want to do that. But if you do number one, right, uh, maybe leave it for a, a little bit, right? Do a couple of number ones, right? And then flush your toilet, okay? Because again, 27% is being used. Washing clothes, 22% of the water used in our home is used to wash clothes. So look at that. That's 49%, almost 50%, and if you got ash and dishwasher, it was 50%, well, we're not even drinking it, right? Leaks, 14%, that just goes away. Faucets, there's what we're drinking, 15%. Showers, about 17%, right? So if you can cut some of these percentages down, take shorter showers, don't flush the toilet as much, maybe only wash clothes when you have a full load of laundry, right? Don't just wash one piece of clothing, wait till you have a full, a full load you can save a significant amount of water over the long run. And again, these are type of the things that, that, that we'll talk about. So here what we're looking at, uh, this is water scarcity hotspots. So again, uh, this is where there could be an issue with water, right? So uh, anywhere you see red, that's a highly likely conflict potential, meaning uh, California, Nevada, Arizona may fight to see who gets this water from the Colorado River. Again, they may not fight with guns and knives and things like that, but there could be regulations. There could be some interstate squabbles there. Again, you'll notice in the middle of California, there's some issues here, right? Parts of Colorado. So again, just saying how here in Ardsley, we got plenty of fresh water, but in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, uh, that is definitely not the case. So we got to talk about your water footprint. You remember way back at the beginning of this course, we spoke about our carbon footprint, right? Well, our water footprint is almost just as important. Rough measure of all the water an individual uses. Again, virtual water, we spoke about that a little bit just before, is water used indirectly to produce products and food, but it is considered part of a person's water footprint depending on what they consume, right? So going back to this chart, okay? Producing and delivering a single one of these products listed here requires the equivalent of nearly one and usually many bathtubs full of water. So again, going back to this chart, we looked at it again, just again, gives you an idea of the virtual water needed. So you live in a huge home, you're going to have a rather big water footprint, right? You drive a couple of cars, you're going to draw have a rather big water footprint. You own a lot of clothes. My daughter, she always says she has no clothes. She's 15. Uh... I go into her closet, I can't even get in there. There's so many clothing, right? She has a high water footprint because she owns a lot of clothing. So again, think about that the next time you go out to buy a, a t-shirt or you're going to have that hamburger or something like that, guys. Just think about how much virtual water you are using uh, and what your water footprint may or may not be. Because, unfortunately... The point of this is that fresh water shortages are going to continue to grow around the globe unless we do something about it. So many of the world's major river systems are highly stressed either by use or by pollution. This is the Nile, right? The Jordan River, the Yangtze River, and the Ganges River. More than 30 countries face freshwater scarcity, okay? And the estimate is by the middle of this century, 
close to 60 countries may face freshwater scarcity, meaning they're not going to have enough fresh water uh, for their population. 30% of Earth's land area experienced severe drought, and research predicts this will worsen with global warming. Again, it's distributed unevenly. Some places get droughts, some places do not. Again, how do you uh, how do we get the water from the places that don't have droughts to the places that do have droughts? That's what we need to figure out. Again, this is your natural capital degradation. Again, this is your freshwater shortages where the stress is high. Again, you'll notice the Western U.S. Very high stress here with water. Most of Northern Africa into the Middle East, okay? Again, you can understand why, right? Very dry there, desert uh, desert biomes, all right? Uh, parts of South America, even parts of Europe now uh, beginning to get a little bit of stress uh, with that water. So again, just goes to show you, uh, again, here in Ardsley, we're lucky, right? Other parts of the world, not that lucky. So is groundwater a sustainable resource? Groundwater used to supply cities and grow food is being pumped from many aquifers faster than it is being replenished by precipitation. So that's the problem. It is a sustainable resource, water, fresh water. It is, it is a renewable resource over the course of, a, of one's lifetime. But unfortunately, we're pumping the water out of the aquifers faster than rain or snow can refill those aquifers. And that is unsustainable, right? So it could be sustainable, but we're making it unsustainable because we're just pumping too much water out of these aquifers aquifers too quickly. Again, aquifers are renewable resources for fresh water unless they are contaminated. Uh, widespread drilling of wells by farmers, however, has accelerated the overpumping of these aquifers, and we're noticing water tables are beginning to sink, right? That's the water table. Below it, saturated. Above it, not saturated. We're seeing the water table sink as, again, we're pumping all that water uh, out of our aquifers. In 20, uh, 2008, Saudi Arabia announced it had depleted its major deep aquifer. So again, this is happening, folks, uh, that this is, we, we're seeing these aquifers being depleted. So one of our favorite charts, right, for FRQs, withdrawing groundwater, the advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, useful for drinking and irrigation, exists almost everywhere, renewable if not over pumped or contaminated, and it's cheaper to extract than most surface waters. The disadvantages, aquifer depletion from over pumping, sinking of land, otherwise known as subsidence from over pumping. I'm going to show you a great picture in just a minute uh, that really uh, hits home with the subsidence uh, issue. Some deeper aquifers are non-renewable. Why? Because if they're so deep in the ground, it will take thousands of years for water to seep all the way down there, to infiltrate all the way down there. So if they're really deep aquifers, they're not going to be a, a, a renewable resource, again, on, on a human's life uh, span like that. It's going to take longer uh, for that water to get down there. And the pollution of aquifers lasts decades or centuries. You pollute an aquifer, guys, you're not really cleaning it up. It, it takes forever to clean up, very expensive. Uh, again, it's way down under the ground, tough to get to. So again, once your aquifers are polluted, uh, you're pretty much done there. So there is the Ogata Aquifer in the central part of the United States that we are seeing over pumping issues. So the Ogata Aquifer is the largest known aquifer. It irrigates the Great Plains, right? The central U.S. It is a very slow recharge and we're seeing water tables dropping because water is being pumped 10 to 40 times faster than the recharge rate. So we're taking water out almost 40 times faster than we're recharging it with, with the precipitation, rain, snow, uh, runoff, etc. Uh, government farm subsidies result in further depletion. Again, just makes it cheaper. And biodiversity is being threatened in some areas. So here is what we're talking about. Uh, again, these are the groundwater overdrafts. Here's your Agala Aquifer right here in the middle of the country. And again, what we're looking here is actually water level changes significantly more than 45 meters, right? Of, of water table dropping in parts of the uh, middle of our country because we're pulling too much water out of this Ogala Aquifer. Again, we're seeing the results. So this isn't, you know, that we talk about this is kind of, you know, up in the air, may happen, may not. It's happening, folks. We're seeing it happen, right? We're seeing the water level drop over 45 meters in parts of Texas and parts of Kansas. That is because people are over pumping the aquifer, pulling too much water out too quickly and not allowing the aquifer to be 
replenish. So what are the harmful effects of overpumping these aquifers? Well, it limits food production and raises prices, right? Because eventually you're not going to have any water to irrigate. That's going to lessen your food. That'll then raise the food prices. Once again, that will then widen the gap between rich and poor, right? The rich, the rich could handle those, those rising food prices. The poor cannot. You get land subsidence. I'm going to show you that picture. This is when the land collapses. San Joaquin Valley in California. Mexico City is having problems with this. Also, so if you take out too much groundwater near coastal regions, then salt water could potentially get in from the ocean. And again, once you contaminate your groundwater with salt water, you're done, folks. It takes thousands of years for that salt water to get out. Uh, and that aquifer is basically non-usable if you contaminate it with salt water. So this is an incredible picture, guys. This is a poll. This is not, this is real. This is the San Joaquin Valley in California. This is 1977. In 1925, guys, the ground was up here. Think about that. In 1925, this was the ground. This was all underground. They're pumping water up at this aquifer, right? You have the water in this aquifer. What happens? You get rid of the water. Now you just have a big hole. So what happens? Subsidence or the ground begins to sink into that hole. In 1955, this was the ground layer. And then when this picture was taken in 1977, there's your ground. That's incredible. A little over 50 years. The ground sunk or subsided, subsidence, sunk this much of a distance because of water being pulled out of an aquifer in the San Joaquin Valley causing the ground to sink. That's pretty powerful, guys. I don't know about you. That's pretty powerful. All right, so solutions, right? Prevention, use water more efficiently, which is what we talked about in previous slides. Subsidize water conservation. So don't pay people to use the water, pay people to not use it. Limit the number of wells, stop growing water intensive crops, right? Go back to that polyculture, those models, that more traditional agriculture. Control, raise prices of water to discourage waste. There's your full cost pricing. Tax water pumped from wells near surface water. Again, make it more expensive. Build rain gardens in urban areas to trap rainwater and use permeable paving material on streets, sidewalks, and driveways. Why permeable? Because when it rains on a street, that water runs off into a river and then runs off into the ocean and it's not usable. However, if the pavements and sidewalks were permeable, the water could infiltrate, get into the groundwater, and then we can pump it out and use it. So again, maybe trying to come up with, and maybe this is a, a way some of you can make money, come up with a, a permeable uh, sidewalk, streets, driveways, right? Something that we can pave a road with that is also permeable may make you a lot of money and may save the environment as well. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about dams for the last couple of slides here, um, and then we will conclude part one, and we'll talk more about dams in part two, all right? So, how can we increase freshwater supplies? Well, large dam and reservoir systems can help with this, right? They can greatly expand water supplies in some areas. However, dams and are not always the best because they disrupt ecosystems and they also displace people. When you build a dam, you basically take a river, put a dam in, and then whatever's behind that river, the water backs up and forms a lake. Well, if you had towns and cities along that river, you have to move those people because you're going to have a big lake forming. Obviously, if you have creatures that are used to living in this river, now all of a sudden there's a dam. They can't get down to the river below. The lake is a different type of biome than a river. And so you actually can disrupt ecosystems. So dams aren't the best. Again, they definitely help, um, but they're not the best when it comes to the environment. So the main goal of a dam and reservoir system is to capture and store runoff, right? Um, and then you can relief runoff, uh, release it slowly, and that's good for flood control. You can generate electricity. We'll talk about uh, uh renewable energy, hydropower uh, in another chapter. You can supply irrigation water and you can actually use it for recreation, the reservoirs, right? You can swim, you can boat, you can uh, sail, uh, do things like that. Uh, reservoirs increase the reliable runoff available for use. But again, they displace people. So there's always the yin and the yang here, right? The good with the bad. Um, they impair ecological services of the river because as the river flows, it's cleaning itself. Flowing water cleans itself. Well, once you hit this lake now, uh, that kind of stops. 
You can endanger plant and animal species that are used to living in a fast flowing river. Now they're living in a lake, which is usually warmer. The water isn't flowing, right? So it's a completely different biome. And these reservoirs can also fill up with sediment within 50 years. Uh, and then you have other problems, right? We talked about how sediment is a water polluter, right? Sediment, even though it's not chemicals or things like that, uh, you don't want a lot of sediment uh, in your water. Uh, Oroville Dam in California was com compromised by extremely heavy rainfall after se of a, severe uh, a severe drought. So that could be another issue with dams, right? The main spillway was damaged, which almost caused the entire uh, dam to collapse. Uh, 180,000 people were evacuated with only an hour's notice, but we've had had reports in the past of dams collapsing around the world uh, and flooding and killing lots of people. So again, that's uh, uh, one of the bad things that you have with dams. Uh, here are two images of that Oroville Dam, left before and then right, uh, the spillway failure in 20, uh, February 2017. Severe rain and snowmelt required the use of spillways to prevent the dam from overtopping, so it almost overspilled. They created this spillway, uh, again, release the water to kind of help it a little bit. But again, these are just some of the issues uh, that we can have with dams. So this is a good picture, guys. Uh, in green are advantages of dams. In the reddish or the orange are disadvantages of dams. Again, my advice is to understand this as much as you can, the advantages and disadvantages. So advantages provides irrigation, water above and below the dam, provides water for drinking, our reservoir useful for recreation and fishing can produce cheap electricity, reduces downstream flooding, right? What are bad things? Flooded land destroys forests and crop land and displaces people above the dam. Large losses of water through evaporation. So now you have this lake, large surface area, getting a lot of evaporation, so you're actually going to lose some water. Uh, deprives downstream crop land and estuaries of nutrient-rich silt because it's all getting blocked by the dam. Risk of failure and devastating downstream flooding, obviously an issue, and it disrupts the migration and spawning of some fish, right? Salmon need to get from the ocean to their uh, nesting grounds to breed. Well, guess what? You throw a dam in that river, I don't care how high the salmon can jump, they're not jumping over a dam. So there actually are dams out there that have steps uh, that wrap around them that actually allow the salmon and the fish to kind of jump up, uh, and that's just one of, a way, uh, one of the ways to create a, a more uh, ecologically friendly and a more ecological logically sustainable type of dam. Uh, climate change intensifies weather extremes. Mountain snowpack may be reduced, making less freshwater available downstream of the dams. When water levels drop, hydroelectric dams cannot function, so now you're not making electricity anymore. Uh, and believe it or not, the Colorado River most likely will not be able to meet the water needs in Arizona, New Mexico, and California um, as we go through the next 50 to 100 years uh, because of the overpumping and all the uh, issues that that we have already spoke about. Okay, so that's going to end part one of my lecture on chapter 13, Water Resources. Uh, we'll start off part two by talking more about dams, uh, so make sure to tune in for that. And as always, I thank you for listening.